I'm Jane Flitt, President of the Library Foundation, and I am thrilled to share with you that because of all of your support, we have smashed, smashed our goal for this evening. <laughs> now, we certainly know that <clears throat> the top of the line of, for our team was John Grisham and Stephen King, so let's hear it for them. <clears throat> and it was their graciousness of donating their time and their books I hope you all bought raffle tickets, but you have the opportunity after this event to still bid on the silent auction and help us raise even more money for literacy. This is a critical crisis for our county, and together our library system is going to be able to help address the fact that today nearly 50% of all of our third graders cannot read at a third grade level. And we're gonna help do something about that. And it's not... <laughs> it is not only with Mr. Grisham and Mr. King's help, but with all of you. You are part of this amazing, caring team that says we unite over something so important as literacy. And we are blessed to have each and every one of you here and all of our generous sponsors and the media that help promote this wonderful event. I hope if you haven't had a chance that you will take a look and um, warmly thank all of the sponsors, all of the dedicated volunteers, and all of the significant organizations and individuals who have made this possible. However, I need to spotlight a few organizations and people. Northern Trust has stepped up to be our presenting sponsor, and we are ever grateful that they are here. Our Library Foundation Board is made up of only volunteers, and Susan Wilcox, a board member, stepped up graciously to be our event chair. She has been extraordinary, applying her professional know-how, her southern charm, and her attention to incredible detail. Many of you who called likely spoke to Susan, and I assure you that she assigned each and every one of the seats you're sitting in. So let's have an amazing round of applause for Susan. Closely following, right behind her, has been another board member and our treasurer, who is also a volunteer, Paul Lynch, who processed every single transaction linked to this event with incredible meticulousness, accuracy, and devotion, even on his vacation. <laughs> and, and, and we are overjoyed 
that when this event is completed, he and his wife will regain their dining room table. I also need to have a shout out for Anne and Eugene Beckstein, who through their family foundation underwrote so that nearly 30 students from the State College could be here tonight. They genuinely care. <laughs> and finally, we couldn't have had this event with our amazing honorary chairs, Representative Jim and Sandy Boyd, who you may remember last year rolled up their sleeves and helped produce an amazing event. And today and tonight, let me warmly introduce them and please thank them. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jane, thank you all. Um, you know, when Jane Plitt asks you to do something, you just do it and don't ask questions. She is an amazing lady, and Susan Wilcox, thank you so much for such a great, great idea and a great evening. And Sandy and I are just thrilled to be part of it. This is truly a highlight of our year. Last year, we stood in the green room uh, before the presentation, and we had a chance to talk to Mr. King, and, you know, we were kind of starstruck a little bit. I'm like, it's talking, and how do we top this, Mr. King? What do we do to top this next year? And he goes, you know what, I have an idea. I've got a really good friend who might be interested in coming. And when he said, I said, well, I wonder who that would be. And, you know, I thought maybe James Patterson because li his family lives here. And he said, John Grisham. And we just kind of about fell over. But huge and enormous thanks to Stephen King for his generosity, his graciousness for doing this. And I'll be very brief, but this, this needs to be said, and I'm going to use a few notes because I don't want to miss anything. This would not be possible without our sponsors, as Jane mentioned, and certainly our presenting sponsor, Northern Trust. I think when they presented the idea to Stephanie Goforth and Northern Trust, it took her about five seconds to say, yes, we'll be presenting sponsor again. Stephanie's the president of Northern Trust West Florida Region. She's You're going to get to clap in just a second, I promise. She's responsible for all aspects of Northern Trust wealth management business, including investment management, trust, and fiduciary management. Uh, she's in Naples, and she covers all the way up to Tampa. She's a proud graduate of University of South Florida, where she majored in business management. She grew up in a little town uh, just by St. Pete Gulfport, just right up, uh, right up the coast from us. And she demonstrates her commitment by serving on several key boards throughout West Florida, including the University of South Florida, where she serves on the Board of Trustees. She's a great leader, a great business person, and most of all, just a great person. So help me welcome our presenting sponsor, Stephanie Goforth. Sorry, I have to put these on, you know, age. Good evening. As Jim said, I'm Stephanie Goforth, the Regional President for Northern Trust. Along with all of my Northern Trust partners that are here tonight, we are honored to be the presenting sponsor of Bookends, an evening with two literary giants. Before we be begin, let me just tell you a little bit about Northern Trust. Our company started 126 years ago. We have weathered the Great Depression, two wars, two world wars, and the 2008 financial crisis. We have not only survived, but we have thrived during these times of significant market and economic stress. We believe that the reason that we have grown to be such a global financial leader is because and due to our local participation, some of which you'll see tonight. So we thank you and the authors for supporting this event as all of the proceeds tonight will go to a fund critically needed literacy program. You just heard a little bit from Jane on this right here in our community. Now it's truly a pleasure to introduce our guest speakers. Both are literary giants. Both are passionate about their charitable endeavors and both are a little fanatical about baseball. <laughs> Long before John Grisham's name became synonymous with the modern legal thriller, he was working 60 to 70 hours a week at a small Mississippi law practice squeezing in time before going to the office and during courtroom recesses to work on his hobby, writing his first novel. 
Since publishing A Time to Kill, and we all remember it, 1988, Grisham has written one to two novels a year. Um, his other books are, of course, The Firm, The Pelican Brief, The Client, and most recently, just out, Rogue Lawyer. He annually gives away millions that focus on local initiatives in Mississippi and Virginia and justice outfits such as the Innocence Projects. The man who dreamed of being a professional baseball player now serves as the local Little League Commissioner. Six ball fields he built on his property have played host to over 350 kids and 26 Little League teams. Quite the accomplishments. Our next author, Stephen King, has published more than 50 novels, five nonfiction books, many of which have been adopted into feature films, TV movies, and even comic books. Some of his most popular films include Carrie, The Shining, The Stand, Misery, It, and The Dark Tower. And he has sold more than 350 million copies of his books worldwide. Stephen King's foundation helps support artists who are unable to work due to health problems along with many other social concerns. And of course, we know how big a supporter he is to libraries. Last year, he received the National Medal for the Arts, the highest honor bestowed upon any artist by the United States. Please join me in welcoming John Grisham and Stephen King. Oh, come on. Don't. Don't stop. <laughs> this guy came from Virginia after having hip surgery two weeks ago, so give him another hand. John said to me, uh, I will come down and do this thing if uh, we get up on stage and you ask me questions and I answer them so I kind of interview you. So um, that is what you said, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I've got this uh, 21st century delivery system which is called a piece of paper. <laughs> you do, oh wait a minute, that's not it. That's uh, Why well, am I nervous, Elton? That's a grocery list. <laughs> so, you know, the question is, what do you ask somebody who's as successful as John Grisham? And uh, what I started off with is, what is the question you get asked the most so I don't <laughs> ask it? You know, I get asked that question so many times, I've learned to hate that question. So I, just, <laughs> I never answer that question. Um, can I first of all say I'm happy to be here? Uh, thank you for the invitation. This is a beautiful setting, a beautiful night, and uh, uh, so far very warm hospitality. Stephen sent me an email, I don't know, five, six, seven months ago, and said basically um, this is where I hang out in the wintertime. It's a great library. I did a fundraiser this past spring. It's a lot of fun. Uh, why don't you come on down? And uh, when Stephen does that, I have never, never said no. Uh, and we've been on stage together several times uh, in the past 20 some odd years. Yep. Always have a lot of fun. Uh, it is yep. totally unscripted until tonight when somebody made a list of questions. Well, uh, yes, so I'm really I nervous make about a list these of questions. questions, John, but they're damn good questions. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to Hey, you. let me tell a story. Can we just tell stories, right? Let's just tell stories. And I'll think about your questions later. Maybe I don't like your questions. Well, I, uh, I got to ask you one question, and then you can go ahead and tell stories because he used to be a lawyer. He's used to running things, so that's <laughs> the way it is. Have you ever considered writing a horror novel? Not really, because, uh, no, it's just, I don't, that's not what I think about writing. Um, some of my legal tales are terrifying enough uh, that, 
But I've never really thought about a horror novel. <laughs> well, some people would say writing about lawyers is a horrible it's, subject. It's close, close enough. Um, now, can I tell a story? Yeah, go okay. ahead. Okay, the first time, um, it was the spring of 1991, and the firm had just been published. And in March of 91, the firm popped up on the New York Times bestseller list for the first time. And that was a big, big deal for any unknown writer still is. You know, you feel like you've kind of arrived. And not long after that, I got a letter in the mail, note card, a uh, small envelope in the mail, postmarked Bangor, Maine. And it was a note from Stephen. It's actually Bangor, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, David Letterman used to say, Bangor, I hardly even know her. Not my joke. Go ahead, John. Bangor? Bangor? Bangor. Bangor. Okay. Well, it, it was from Stephen. And he basically said, uh, it was a very short note, he said, welcome to the big time. Congratulations. And I thought that was a pretty classy uh, move on his part. <laughs> Not long after that, he called me one day and said, uh, have you ever heard of the National Book Awards? And I said, not really. What is it? What are they? He said, well, it's a bunch of uh, snotty, literary New York people who get together once a year and pat themselves on the back and hand out awards that are very serious in nature to serious literary artists. And I said, then why are you calling me? <laughs> and he said, here's what I'm going to do. I want to go this year. I bought a table with 10 seats. I'm going to invite a bunch of commercial authors, a bunch of popular authors, and we're going to put on tuxedos. We're going to the National Book Awards and stink up the place. <laughs> Can you do it? And I said, I, I would never say no to that. So I took off to New York, and I met Stephen for the first time. We had on, we had on tuxedos, looked pretty dashing, and we behaved. We did, did not get any fights, but we behaved ourselves. We had, a, we had a great night, and I can't remember uh, who else was there. Donald Westlake, for sure. Donald Tabby Westlake. Tabby was there. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember who else was there. But it was a, met, met the Pierre Hotel, walked over to the National Book Awards, yeah. and um, had and a then, great time. And then a few years later, I got a letter from those National Book Award people saying, we want to give you a National Book Award, meaning me, for your contribution to literature. American literature. So, of course, I said yes, it was a big deal and everything, but really, it wasn't for a book, so I felt a little bit like, you know how in the Miss America pageant they always have Miss Congeniality? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I felt kind of like that. It, actually, it was hotly controversial. Yes, it was. When they gave you the award because you're just an ordinary popular author as opposed to a highbrow literary star. Yeah. And you invited us to come up for that, and we, went, we were there that night, yeah. basically for, for fiscal support, because it was very controversial, and that, that, again, they showed mm -hmm. how snooty they can be, I guess. So, they said... By the way, I've never, they've never called me, Steve. Well, they, they will. Just all you've got to do is live long enough, you know. <laughs> Sooner or later, you know, I've gotten a lot of awards lately. I got an award, you know, from President Obama in November. I think part of it is because you haven't died, you know. So they give you that award. But I, I made a speech at the National Book Awards. They said, you're going to have to make a speech. And my wife said, what are you going to make a speech about? And I said, well, I think I'll spank them a little because none of them have read uh, a lot of popular fiction. And I'm going to talk about all the, uh, all the uh, writers that they haven't read. And the woman who won the award that year was a, a woman who said in her speech, we don't need a reading lesson from Stephen King. Yeah. And I thought, I thought, you goddamn well do. <laughs> but anyway, you know, you were telling a story about the first time, you know, that you, how you found out that, what fascinated me was you said that A Time to Kill, which was not your, not at the time, the firm, right, right. actually sold to the movies right. before, Right. It sold as a book. A Time to Kill uh, was published in, in the summer of 1989 by a small unknown publishing company in New York. Oddly enough, the guy who worked there is kind of a 
you know, it was a very small outfit. Let's put it, it was not one of the big publishers. But the guy who finally saw A Time to Kill after all the big publishers had said no and a bunch of agents had said no, uh, the guy who finally um, said, I'll buy this book and I'll publish this book, was a guy named Bill Thompson. And so we took off to New York, my wife and I, just thrilled. We had lunch with Bill Thompson, and he told us another story. And he said about 15 years earlier, he was a senior editor at Doubleday, and he received a manuscript uh, in the mail from Bangor, Maine. <laughs> and the guy who Terrific, said... Terrific, John. That was really good. But, hang on. I'm not finished. And so he, he said... Uh, the, the book was really good, but it wasn't quite good enough. The guy who sent the book did not have a telephone for Bill to call and talk about it. So Bill sent it back. By return mail, there was another manuscript from Bangor. And Bill said it was really good, not quite good enough. This goes on three or four times. And finally, he gets the manuscript. I think it was either number four or number five. He reads it and he says, we're going to publish this. And the book was Carrie and the novelist was Stephen King. And in Stephen's book on writing, he has a copy of the telegram, no telephone again, telegram from Bill Thompson, we're going to pay you 2500 bucks mm -hmm. for Carrie. And so he, my point is Bill Thompson is a really great editor. But the last line of that telegram, I never forgot it. He said, Carrie officially a double day book, $2,500. And the last line of the telegram, there were these things called telegrams. Some of you may remember them. <laughs> they were, came in yellow envelopes and they had... 1972, right? They 72. Had, yeah, they, they had words on them, you know, like that. So the last line was, the future lies ahead, and it really did. But you know, Bill was a, a great guy. Yeah, yeah. Because I was nobody, I was a little teacher from, you know, I was living way out in the country in Maine, teaching in a country school. And I sent him a, a book, uh, actually, that was later published. It was called The Running Man. And uh, they made a terrible movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. But I wrote Oh, we're going to talk about movies? <laughs> well, I wrote the book. Let's get know, some dirt going. Yeah, right. No, 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 no dirt. No dirt, John. I know you'd like that. You're a lawyer. <laughs> but no dirt. The book was written in a week because that was the school vacation, that's how long I had. And he sent it back, but he sent it back with a letter that made it clear that he'd actually read it, you know? That somebody out there was actually looking for stuff that was good. And like, you're right, there were two or three other books pretty much by return mail. And he rejected them, but gently and with, with hope, you know, with a sense of encouragement. And he used to send me these country music calendars that I put up in my office, you know. It'd be Dolly Parton on one month and George Jones on the next. Because we're going back, what, 40 years, I guess. So those three or four books he sent back by return mail, you later published those, right? I mean, you, you went back and fixed yeah. them, right? On Salem's the, Lot and Shining and... Well, no, they, the, the ones that I sent Bill were actually published under a pen name, Richard Bachman. Oh, yeah, I remember uh, him. There was a book called he, he didn't last Walk for long, did he? One called The Running Man, and Thinner. Th Thinner was the one that kind of blew my cover. My, my agent said, you know, people are starting to get the idea that Richard Bachman might be Stephen King. I think we need to put an author photograph on the back of it. So he got his tire salesman to uh, take a picture. He looked, he looked better than I did. He had that rugged, writerly look. So what about A Time to Kill? So, okay, back, back, to, back to our story here. Uh, Time to Kill came out in the summer of 89, and they printed 5,000 hardback copies, and I bought 1,000 of them. I mean, <laughs> I was trying to sell the things out of the trunk of my car. I had this notion that in our little small hometown where I lived in Mississippi, there was not a decent bookstore, but we had a really good library. And so I went to my librarian, and I said, hey, I got this novel coming out, and, and I'm going to buy 1,000 copies of the book. Let's have a huge, big book party. And so my hometown can come celebrate, you know, what I've done. And we, we did that. And we have pictures of my kids who were very small back then climbing on a thousand copies of A Time to Kill. <laughs> That's a lot of books, by the way. That's a lot of books. So we had this huge book party. And a lot of folks showed up, and a lot of folks didn't. And I took names for a long time, okay? 
when the book party was over, I still owned 882 copies of A Time to Kill. And I had an invoice coming to pay for the things. I was going you know, <laughs> to make some profit there, some royal. I had it all figured out. And so I went back to my librarian in a panic, and I said, hey, uh, you know, I can kind of take this show on the road and go to, if you have buddies with other libraries. And it took me 35 libraries later, and I unloaded A Time to Kill. And uh, those things are now worth... Um, And you know what? It's a hell of a book. If you haven't read it, you ought to. That's a terrific novel. The, um, it stands up. It stands I, up. The thing about Time to Kill, once it, once it came out in the uh, summer of 89, um, I had, it, it had spent two years in New York getting passed around, and my agent, I had a good agent at the time, he said, write the next book, get it written. By the time A Time to Kill comes out, I'll have something to sell. Well, the second book was The Firm, and I sent The Firm to New York, fall of 89 and nothing happened. I mean, it, it kind of sat around the fall of 89. He showed it to some people. There was no, um, there was no demand for the book. And they then- must be, uh, They must be kicking themselves now. Uh, God, I hope so. I hope they're kicking themselves so they bleed. Hard, yeah. And, and so, well, this, is, this is the luckiest break in my career. I had nothing to do with it. It just happened because these things happened back then. I'm not sure about now, but, um, a bootleg copy of the manuscript, somebody copied it in New York and they paid for it, it used to happen all the time. A Hollywood scout got it, sent it to a guy in LA, he made 20 copies, pretending to, to be my agent rep or something, and he sent uh, a copy to all the studios in uh, December of 89. I knew nothing about it, my agent knew nothing about it. And he got nervous when he started getting offers. And the offers got bigger and bigger, and so finally he called uh, my agent <clears throat> and said, um, hey, look, you know, I meant to call you, this, that, whatever, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> and they had this big cuss fight and, you know, was, you know lawsuits. And anyway, they, they said, look, we're all about to make some money here. Let's, let's stay with this, and let's do the, the next round of bidding, okay? And so the first Sunday in January in 1990, uh, I was actually at church Sunday morning. My wife comes in late, as always. I had one kid, she had the other. And she said, go call New York. Mm -hmm. Your agent just called. Well, these people don't work on Fridays, or you know, they don't work on, work on a Sunday. Unheard of. So I ran home, and I called my agent, and he said, I need your, he's very abrupt, he said, I need your uh, authority to take the highest offer from <clears throat> Paramount Pictures, Disney, Touchstone or Universal Pictures for the film rights to the firm. I said, what about the book rights? <laughs> he said, well, talk about it later. Um, <laughs> I, need, I need your authority. Uh, he, said they're sitting, <laughs> he said they're sitting by their phone for the final round of bidding. Well, the word bidding had a nice ring to it on Sunday morning. Yes, and yes. I said, okay. I said, fine. You know, I, I, I was totally clueless. And uh, I said, okay, just for fun, how much money are we talking about here? He said, I'm asking for 400000 and I hope to get half a million. And I said, you want my authority to go do that? And he said, yeah. I said, okay, you got my authority. And um, a couple of hours later, we came in from church. The phone was literally ringing, and it was my agent. He said, we sold the film rights, the film rights to Paramount Pictures uh, for $600,000. And I said, you know, we were, I couldn't even hardly talk. I sat down with M M Renee. Renee, my, my wife and I were both were raised in these real small, tight-knit, conservative Southern Baptist families where you never talked about money outside the family. There was no money inside the family, but you, <laughs> you didn't discuss money, okay? And we said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We can't believe this. We'll tell people that we've sold the film rights but we are never, we're never going to talk about this stuff. It's, it's going to change everything. Oh, I got to hear the rest of this. Well, for, well you, first thing Monday morning, Paramount issues a press release with all the details and so. It was a secret, a secret deal in Hollywood. Yeah. You know, you said something, we were sitting backstage, uh, the way that uh, big shots like us sit backstage and... Uh, <laughs> You were saying, you know, and this is interesting to me because we're doing a library event. We're raising money for, for a library. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and every buck you guys paid 
goes towards something that I feel like Rick Scott in the state of Florida should also be underwriting because, you know. Call, call me a commie simp if you want, but I actually think the arts are sort of important and kind of like a, a keystone to thought and democracy, but probably, you know, I'm the sort of guy that Ted Cruz was just, you know, boom. But what you See, said... Let's stay away from politics. Have right, you got another okay. question over there? I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, well, I'm going to... Wait, 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 wait. Never mind that. What I wanted to say is based on... You said back there that we're a couple of famous writers in a society that doesn't read. So, you know, you were well, saying... We're, ta we're talking about... Um, we're talking about... They we're not like us, Michael Jackson. They, they were asked us if, if we. Well, get, he's dead, you know. But if, if we can, we, you know, do we live normal lives? Do we can we go out in public? Do we go out to restaurants? Can we walk around? You know, and the answer is absolutely yes. And we rarely, I rarely get recognized. Steve has a more exotic look about him, you know. When you kind of, <laughs> you know, you, to, you remember that face, okay? Um, remember when he had the beard, this big bushy beard on the, on oh, the back of his on. dust I mean, jacket? You're, you're the guy really, who was the heartthrob really, after really. that jacket photo on the firm. You know, he had a little stubble, you know. We were talking studly. That was a long time ago, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lo Anyway, the point is, the point is, you know, we, we, we we're well-known writers, but the truth is we walk down the sidewalk all the time and nobody says anything because it's not really... Uh, that type of culture, but it has made both of us, in dealing with all the movies we've been through uh, and the people we've met, it makes us appreciate uh, how difficult it is to be normal when you're truly famous. And in this society and culture, it's, it's, it's impossible. And so we're, we have, in my opinion, the right level of notoriety. That's all I want. I don't want any more. I got plenty right now. You know, I got I to gotta tell the story I told you about the Nathans. This is back when I was much younger than I am now, you know. I went into a Nathan's Hot Dogs. John's absolutely right. We go places, nobody knows us. I cannot tell you how many times people have come up to me and said, are you Steven Spielberg? <laughs> and I say, yes. <laughs> yes. No, no, I was in uh, Nathan's, and this was, I'd probably published four or five books at that time. In New York? Yeah, Nathan's in New York. And uh, I'm sitting at the counter, and, you know, I had the long hair back then, and, of course, it was, it was all black still, and I had the big black bushy beard. And, and uh, I'm eating a hot dog, and uh, I see the cook looking through the pass-through, and he sees me looking at him, and he's back. He's cooking. He's cooking. And then I'm reading my book, because I take a book everywhere, and, uh, and I look up, and he's looking, and then he's not. So finally, he comes around to the counter side, I think. He knows me. He knows me. <laughs> he says, are you somebody? <laughs> and, I, and I say, everybody's somebody. <laughs> he says, yeah, but are you somebody famous? And I said, well, I'm kind of, mm, I don't know. He says, are you Francis Ford Coppola? <laughs> And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> Signed an autograph for him on a napkin, too. <laughs> uh, your first question, uh, what's the, 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 the question I get the most? Yeah. It's, it, we've talked, we've laughed about this. People say, where do you get your ideas? Every writer hears that. Where do you get your ideas? Where do you get your ideas, John? Where do you get your ideas? Watching corpses? Uh, you know, it, it is, the question is, it's infuriating. I can name ideas that I got for certain books, but they seem to think like there's a, an, a central idea market. A website? Yeah. <laughs> so I used to tell people I get them in Utica. Yeah. There's a little used idea shop. There's the used, but still a lot of wear in them. So, but, I get my ideas by reading newspapers. Yeah, my you know my stories are all about laws, uh, lawyers, firms, trials, litigation, courts, appeals, decisions, and in this country, there's no uh, shortage of material. 
And you, I mean, you look at the newspaper every day, you watch, you know, the, you don't have to look, dig deep. There's always, we have a trial of the century every two years, you know, there's always, always some big trial, some big legal issue that we're all fascinated with. And so that's, that's what I browse just out of habit, always with the idea of taking some issue that I haven't touched on before and maybe weaving a novel around it. That's, that's, what, that's how I spend half my time. And it, it, just, it just comes natural, this constantly surfing, searching for stories about the law. Number two? Well, no, I was just thinking about, uh, yeah, it, uh, I can, I was thinking about, actually, about, about a book I wrote called Misery. And uh, having read a piece somewhere about uh, a killer nurse, who thought that she was doing a favor for her, the patients. She killed like 60 or 70 people. And I thought, I want to write a, a story about that. And uh, no, I was just going to ask you uh, whether or not people still come and ask you to take cases. Did people want you to defend them in court and stuff? I, well, yeah. I mean, I get a lot of, letter from, a lot of letters from prison. Um, <laughs> There are a fair number of lawyers in prison, and <laughs> I'm not kidding. And, they, and listen, they all have fantastic stories. Uh, I was actually doing research for a book called The Brethren, and I went through the, the prison system in, um, in Washington to get approval to visit a federal camp. As it turns out, it's in North Florida. So I flew down, and when I was talking to the warden on the way down, they were very nice. I said, this is a story about a, some judges who are in prison. Do you have any judges? And he thought for a second, says, no, we don't have any judges right now. I said, what about lawyers? He said, oh, we always got a bunch of lawyers. I said, <laughs> I said, I would like to talk to them in a room, you know, just sit around and talk to them. What happened to them? And it was, uh, they were anxious to talk, eager to talk, and it was, a, I took pages and pages of notes, and it was, um, you know, very, very sad, obviously, but also uh, enlightening. What was the question? Oh, I was just asking you, uh, what the hell did I ask yeah. him? I'm glad you wrote them down. Well, You're not even paying attention to We talked about where you got your ideas. Now, wait a minute. Hold on a minute. Oh, man, I don't know. Uh, what was it? Oh, defense about, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, the answer is no. I, uh, I went back to court. Oh, 20 years ago for the last time, and, uh, and when I left that courthouse, trial work is uh, very, very stressful when you do it every day or every week. And I went back in 1996 to, do, to handle the last trial I couldn't get rid of, and I had not been in a courtroom in like five or six years, and I had no business being there. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a skill set, it's a body of knowledge you have to master, and you know, the great trial lawyers that are in court all the time, and I had no business being there, but I would never, um, I, can't, I cannot imagine doing that again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were talking a little bit about the, the movies when we were hanging out backstage, and, uh, well, I was, for me, a lot of people will come up and say, oh, you're Stephen King, I really like your movies, you know? <laughs> and I'll say, well, I've written a few books, too, but, <laughs> They're actually more books than movies. Um, you've had movies made out of your books. How do you feel about them? One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite stories about how to keep humility as a focal point of your life is when they walk up and say, hey man, I know you're John Grisham. Um, I hadn't read your books, but I love your movies. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I hear that and a lot. And you say, thank you, thank, thank you. you. A lot of things you want to say, but you know, why bother? Just let it slide and keep going and be happy that somebody recognized you. You know, we were talking about movies, Steve, because 20 years ago I had the first, you know, several movies came out. Uh, the Firm came first, Pelican Brief, Client, uh, Rainmaker, Time to Kill, Runaway Jury. The Chamber came out then, but it was, it, it was not a good movie, so nobody went to see it. But, uh, you know, those first five or six movies in the early 90s, they had huge casts, uh, big budget films for back then, they were all... Julia Roberts and the Pelican Brief. Yeah, they were, yeah. All, they were all successful movies at the box office around the world, 
everybody made a lot of money off those movies. And they, back then they would pay us, you, the three, you, you me, and Michael Crichton primarily, uh, a lot of money up front for the, on, at contract time, which is unheard of now. But th that was the deal. You write the manuscript, take it to L.A., sell it. They get in high gear. They make a movie that comes out two years later. And again, everybody is, is uh, successful and there's a lot of money made. And for some reason, that model will not work today. I have not had a movie made in 10 years. I mean, I don't fret about it because I can't control any of it. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think most writers, well, this is what Stephen told me the first time I met him. He said, uh, and I, again, I was, a, I was a rookie and I was looking for advice and he was, uh, as he always is, very gracious and thoughtful because he'd been through so much. But he said, look, John, let me tell you something, pal. Uh, <clears throat> when it comes to movies, there are two groups. The first group of writers. The first group... <clears throat> consists of those who do not sell to Hollywood for whatever reason, <coughs> excuse me, they don't sell. That's a small group, okay? The second group consists of those of us who do. And if you're going to sell, there are certain rules involved. Very simple. Number one, get all your money up front. Number two, kiss it goodbye. And number three, expect it to be something different. And if you don't like that, Go join the first group. <laughs> That's what Stephen told me 23 years ago. Something like that. <laughs> something like that. But you know, Ernest Hemingway said, the best deal that a writer can have is a studio pays a lot of money to make a movie out of a book and then never makes the movie. <laughs> so he's a little bit cynical about that. But what I was telling John before was, in a way, a movie saved my career. Um, I was... You know, we've got a lot of things in common. I also got a call uh, on Sunday about sales. I'd, I sold the book to Car uh, the, the novel Carrie to Doubleday. The advance that they paid was $2,500. And believe me, that $2,500 looked like very tall tickets to my wife and I because we were living in a trailer, we had two kids, she was working at Dunkin' Donuts, I was teaching school and working in a laundry in the summertime. And uh, she said, well, $2,500. She said, okay, this is the woman who cut up all the credit cards about a month before. And I said, why did you do that, honey? That golf card was pretty cool. We got it free in the mail. And she said, we can't afford the interest charge. She, she was really smart. She had it together. So, and she looked really cute in her Dunkin' Donut uniform, too. <laughs> it was, oh, man, it was tight. And it was, oh, I just, oh, man. Never mind. The thing is, we got $2,500, and she says to me, don't even think about that money. We're going to get a, we're gonna get a car. We're going to buy a car. And we did. We bought a little uh, economy car, and that's what we had. And she said, is that going to be the end of it? Will it sell or anything? And I said, well, there's paperback. And at that time, Doubleday had something called the 50-50 split which 50% is a lot for an agent. But we were kids. I was 23 and she was 22. We didn't know. So I said they take half of the money, but she said, well, will it sell to paperback? And I said, uh, it might. And if it did, she said, how much could, how much could we get? I, we were in bed and we were talking the way that young married couples do about money and we weren't arguing or anything. But we were wistful because we didn't really expect much. We came from working class families. You don't expect a lot. And I said, well, if we got really lucky, it might go for $60,000. I had that figure in mind because as a school teacher, I was making $22,000 a year. And I thought, well, if I can get $30,000, I can write for a year. I can write 20 books. <laughs> no, that's what John would say. But I figured... <laughs> I, fi I figured I could write one or two. So we moved from the trailer to an even crappier apartment. Um, and uh, I was there one Sunday with, with uh, my daughter. And my wife was up seeing her folks in a little town about 10, 10 miles away uh, in our new car. And, uh, and the phone rang Sunday, just like yours. And it was Bill Thompson, the editor that we had in common. And he said, we sold the paperback rights 
to carry. And I thought, like you did, it's a little strange he's calling on Sunday morning. And uh, I said, well, how much was it? And he said, $400,000. And I, yeah. But you have to picture me in the, in the shitty trailer, you know, where nothing was paid for and the floor was all crazy up and down. And uh, I said, Bill, you said $40,000, right? And he said, no, $400,000. And the strength went out of my legs. I went right down and sat on my ass on the, on the linoleum. And we talked a little bit more and then I hung up. And I thought, I have to get my wife something. I have to get my wife a present. She doesn't know about this. I have to get her something. She'll be back. I didn't want to call her at her folks' house. She's Catholic. She got 9,000 relatives, you know. <laughs> and they all need money all the time. <laughs> no, no, not anymore, but back then they did. So I'm walking around, I'm walking around. I, I'm in Bangor, Maine. What's open? The only thing that was open was the Lavertier's drugstore. So I went downtown and I bought her a hair dryer. <laughs> <laughs> and she got home from her folks and I said, honey, I bought you something. And she said, oh, a hair dryer. <laughs> and then she said, it's beautiful, Steve, but I want you to take it back because we can't afford it. And I said, Bill Thompson called, and we sold the paperback rights for $400,000. She looked at me for a minute, and then she just put her hands over her face and cried, just like you see on TV. That was a nice moment. Nice. <laughs> but, oh wait, 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 wait. I forgot, that isn't what I told you the story. The thing is like, okay, they paid a lot of money. The publisher, the paperback publisher, paid a lot of money. The hardcover publisher, Doubleday, didn't. They had another book coming out that spring that was called Jaws by Peter Benchley. And he was not a poor kid from Maine. He was a prep who went to school with a lot of the Doubledays and everything. So they put all their ad money behind that book. And Carrie didn't get much of anything. They just pocketed the money. And it didn't look like it was going to sell. And then this movie producer named Paul Monash came along and uh, he bought the rights for, I don't know, seven or eight thousand dollars. He got an option and he got a young director named Brian De Palma who had two features under his belt to make the movie. Carrie was a huge hit and that turned the paperback into a bestseller and I was on my way. Otherwise, I don't know what would have happened. So. We, uh, you know, every time we do this, Steve, we've done this three or four times in the past 20 years, uh, and we always thoroughly enjoy it, and, and thanks for having us, but um, every time we together, we always tell the same stories about what it was like back then, and yeah. the dreams of, you know, two kids, one in Maine, one in Mississippi, uh, writing, not knowing if you're ever going to, everybody's ever going to read it, you know, I didn't, I had no idea what was going to happen, and Steve didn't either, but um, you know, we never left our roots. No, we not still really. think about that. And we had, I think, one reason we're both married to extraordinary women. Yeah. Oh. You're Renee, who let you out tonight to do this. How'd you meet? How'd you meet your wife? Or is that too personal? For no, this? no, no. Uh, she was a little girl next door. And um, we, uh, the families knew each other, same school, same church, same neighborhood, same everything. But she was six years younger. Uh -huh. And so I went off to college. And so when I came home from college in 1977, I was 22, um, she had grown up. <laughs> they do that. While I was away. And uh, I couldn't date her for a year because she was only 16 and I was 22, so I had to wait a whole year to ask her out. And she said, sure. Her parents said, hell no. <laughs> she, You're not going out with a Grisham, okay? 
had a couple of rough brothers, okay? The family had some, uh, you know, black sheep. What are you saying, that you were on the wrong side of the tracks? No, we were, ne we were next door, but it was just kind of a big, rough family. And she comes from a family of three girls, and, you know, they just a little bit different. And so um, her parents said, no, you're not, you're not going out with him. And uh, she said, oh, yes, I am. And so I went to pick her up for our first date to that go see. That sounds like her. I like I've her. met the lady. Yeah, yeah. And so our first date was to go see Grease in August of 1978. Love Grease, the movie with Travolta. And um, I went to pick her up. And I was really kind of nervous because, you know, I, I, I knew her parents weren't too thrilled about it. And they had, <laughs> I like that. And they had, they had gone to have dinner. The house was empty. They had left the house. So I got Renee, went out and had her date. And... Uh, Within a month, you know, I was a member of the family. So, again, they had three girls, never a son, and they treated me like a son from almost the very beginning, 37 years ago. Yeah. Can, can I tell a story about my wife, please? Yeah. Just there's a little That's one. all we're doing is telling stories. That's all we're doing, family. yeah. No, but I said, you know, that was a Catholic family, and, you know, if Ray and Sarah Jane Spruce practiced the rhythm method, they had white people's rhythm by, because they had, they, they had eight kids. They had eight kids. There were uh, <clears throat> six daughters and, and two boys. And uh, I met Tabby at the University of Maine, um, where at first I thought she was a waitress because she had a rough mouth and she, she was gorgeous as far as I was concerned. She had red hair and you know she just had a way of walking and talking that said no bullshit i liked it and then i found out that she could write poetry and the poetry really made sense and i liked that so you know we started to date pretty soon you know we we fell in love and uh we decided we were going to get married at that time she was finishing up uh the last year of of college and uh, I was out of college, and I had a nice degree, but I couldn't get a job, so I was working at New Franklin Laundry. We are doing sheets, motel sheets, and that sort of thing, you know. And, uh, you know, we, we took a lot of stuff from the coast of Maine, and uh, we would get the lobster uh, restaurants, and uh, the, the tablecloths and the napkins would come in the boiling heat all the way from the coast, so they were full of maggots and little bits of... <laughs> lobster and that sort of thing. So I was doing that and uh, she was finishing up her degree and we decided we'd get married. And uh, so a couple of years later, her youngest sister told Tabby, Marcella's room was next to, cause she was the youngest daughter and the last one out of the house. Uh, her, she had the good bedroom that was next to the master bedroom where her mother and father were before this wedding. And through the wall, she heard my future father-in-law saying, I will be supporting that four-eyed son of a bitch for the rest of my life. And I thought about that every time I bought him a car in later years. So he, so he came around. Huh? Yeah. He did. He did come around. And yeah, what a great guy! Uh, you know, old Navy from World War II, fought in every theater, and you know, a terrific guy who raised his family in the the old style. You know, uh, go to work, work all day, and and uh, take care of those kids and make sure that they got shoes on their feet and they got a good Catholic education at John Bast High School. So, yeah, it was, it was good, it was good. Back down memory lane here. Um, in 1993, we were living in Oxford, Mississippi, which is our home. Uh, and we have an annual book festival, the uh, Oxford Book Festival. And I called Stephen and I said, hey, why don't you come down and do the book festival? He said, sure. And so we'd been in town for like three years. We went to, we went to school at Ole Miss, and we got married in Oxford, and we built our dream house there in, in around 1990. So Stephen came to Oxford, and we did the book festival and had a great time. We were on stage with a writer named Barry Hanna, who was the MC, and we just 
just, you know, like tonight, just one story after another. Terrific and, time. That wonderful was. time. And so that night, uh, Stephen staying um, down the hallway uh, at, at the bedroom on the end. And so we're in the bed, uh, getting ready for bed. It had been a long day. And so Renee crawls in the bed and she says, what are you doing? I said, well, I was trying to go to sleep. She said, what do you mean you're going to sleep? I said, Renee, it's midnight, okay? We've had a long day. She said, Stephen King is in the house. <laughs> Come on, you know, big deal. She said, no, you, just, you know, we can't just go to sleep. The kids are, you know, down the hall. He's down the hall, and Stephen King's in the house. <laughs> and I said, no, seriously. And so we laid there and talked for a few moments. And by the door, uh, the house was practically new, probably a year or two old. By the door, we had an alarm panel. We set the alarm, and there's a red light means the alarm is set. Green light means it's not set. And we had never seen a yellow light before. <laughs> and this yellow light starts blinking from across the bedroom. And we're watching this control panel. Then there's a slight beep, you know, a sound we've never heard before. That was proof, you know, that Stephen King was in the house. <laughs> so Renee gets even, you know, antsier, and, um, just about to doze off, and suddenly there's something scraping the bedroom window out from outside. And I say, Renee, come on, it's just a tree out there. She says, we don't have any trees. The house is brand new, okay? Something's out there. It's trying to get in. I said, just relax, okay, just settle down. I went through, got, got her settled down, you know, almost to sleep, and then I, I wish I had a recording of this. <coughs> Evidently, on the front porch, these two cats attacked each other. We didn't, ha we didn't have any cats, okay? And there was this great scream that went up, you know, all, just below us down here. We jumped out of our skin, ran downstairs. This was, you know, by now, 2 o'clock in the morning. There's no way anybody's going to sleep. You could practically hear Stephen snoring at the end of the hallway of him. <laughs> I dozed off at some point. Renee never came to bed. She st stayed downstairs on the sofa, probably with a gun of some variety. <laughs> and at daybreak, she comes and gets to the bed. She said, just get him out of here, okay? Just get him out of here. <laughs> what I remember is you coming to the airport to pick me up and did you have some kind of a sports car? It seemed like my ass was scraping the road all the way back. I was really embarrassed. Steven said one thing he wanted to do in Mississippi, he'd never been to Mississippi before. He wanted to go out into the backwoods and go low yeah, riding right. with the rednecks. Mm -hmm. He said, can you find me some rednecks? As so, I remember, John, what you said was, do you want to see some rednecks? I know some rednecks. The problem was I did not have a pickup truck. I actually bought one the, the following year, but I did not have a pickup truck. As it just so happens, a couple of months before at Christmas, Renee had bought me this gorgeous four-door, sleek, black, fancy Jaguar. I mean, it would glow in the dark. And that's what I was sporting around in. So I picked Steve up at the airport, and he was so disappointed. And <laughs> went back to the house, and this was like Saturday afternoon. He said, let's go riding around. Let's go ride. So we got in the Jaguar to go low riding with the rednecks in the backcountry. <laughs> it just wasn't the same, was it? No. no, it wasn't really quite the same at all. You know, I thought... We were going to get in a pickup truck, John, and I thought it was going to have primer paint and it was going to have an old Dixie sticker on the back with that flag and we were going to chew matches in our teeth. Or chewing tobacco. Yeah. Some, we were going to have a little red man and we were going to go back road, but we did go back we road, go back. you know, I said, and we met, uh, we met Larry Brown. Larry Brown. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Larry Brown was living Barry there Hanna then. Barry Hanna was there. Barry and, Hanna. Willie you know, Morris was there. Willie oh. Morris, yeah, a lot of cool Southern writers. I, we had a nice party, and it was... So, all that said, you know, what do you think about publishing today? What do you think about... I mean, we got people out there in that audience tonight that 
our readers, obviously your readers, listen, this is great. You're not home watching TV, you're here. I mean, it's great. <laughs> The, the books win. I mean, it's like Rocky Balboa against Apollo Creed, you know, the books win. But, you know, it's, uh, it's a different world now, isn't it? it? It's very different. You know, I think, I'm not sure what your numbers are like, but half of my sales are all e-books now. Um, yeah. And that's, that number's plateaued. It's been, it's actually been a good run. It's not good for bookstores, but it's really good for publishers because they make so much money off of e-books. Um, they don't have to print a book or ship or whatever, and they don't get to pay the writer very much, um, which is something that we've tried to change. But that's been very profitable. Um, but the, you know, I think what we've learned in the past 10 years, there's always going to be a demand for printed books. And um, <laughs> do, you, do you read print or e-version? I, I, I uh, am sort of like bisexual that way. I read, I, I, I'll tell you what, and this is only because I can afford to do this, but I never read a book on an e-reader that I didn't have a hardcover or a paperback of that book to put on the shelf because it seems to me that books are real objects. I mean, if you drop a book into the toilet, you can fish it out and dry it off. You drop your Kindle in there, you're pretty well Right. How often do you how often do you do this? Well, <laughs> I have never dropped a Kindle into the commode, but I have dropped a book or two, particularly in the days before I quit drinking. You know? <laughs> but no, I mean, I don't know about you. I don't sell as many books as I used to. There was a time when uh, you know combined hardcover and paperback, you you might do a million too. Right. I mean, we're very fortunate, obviously, right. to do that kind of business, but. I don't know whether, you know, readers are just sort of dropping by the wayside or what. Publishers don't really do surveys, do they? Really? I, I don't, I've never seen a survey. I know my numbers are, have been trending down for 15 years. I think yours, you've seen too. the same thing. Yeah. I think that's true with all popular authors, um, which, you know, it sounds, it, that sounds bad. We've <laughs> had our day. <laughs> it was good while it lasted. <laughs> But the truth is, um, and I still say this, and I hope I, it doesn't sound naive, when I talk to aspiring writers, uh, it, yeah, it's more difficult to get published today probably than it was when we got published. We got, you know, even though it was impo looked impossible back then. But every year, every year you have dozens of first-time authors who come out with novels. Uh, some are good, some are, some are not so good. And I, and, I, and I keep telling people over and over, if what you're writing is good, it will eventually be noticed. Yeah. Because there are so many people now looking for uh, new material with all the different methods of publication now and, and you know, instant communication. You know, if, if, if you're writing something good, it is eventually going to be noticed. And if it's not eventually noticed, you probably are wasting your time. Yeah. People, people love stories. And uh, this guy here is a hell of a storyteller. Um, just is. We're from the beginning. And uh, I'm not sure whether that's a, I think, I think that's a honed skill, but I also think that there's something built in uh, because your stories drew me from the first. Uh, obviously, you know, somebody sent me, a, Doubleday sent me a galley of The Firm. When I read The Firm, then I doubled back and I read A Time to Kill. And since then, I've, I've been with it. But, uh, you know, the story about Bill Thompson um, taking my book, Carrie, and your book, uh, of all the people, and, you know, people would say to me when I was getting rejection slips and pounding away at stories, well, you'll probably never happen. There are so many writers out there that are established. And I said, well, I have youth on my side. They've got to die. I mean, James Michener. <laughs> James Michener is older than God, and, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, Herman Woke is God. He's still alive. He's 100 years old, and uh, he published a book last year. But I figured that I would have a chance for that. But still, somebody has to look and see that gold, you know, that, because it's a business, isn't it? Yeah. I, I don't recall ever thinking about, um, yeah, I mean, you, you never believe you're going to get published. I used to do this, and it was really not 
you know, not smart to do, but I'd walk in a, like a Walden bookstore, the old B. Dalton bookstore, or Barnes and Noble, in a big mall somewhere, you mm-hmm. know, or in Memphis where we lived. And I'd see the wall just covered with, you know, dozens and dozens of brand new uh, books. And I would think, God, there's no room for me. I mean, who wants to, who wants to hear from me? What, what do I have to say? What do I have to say? And it'd be, I'd get depressed for a while. And I would stop, you know, maybe I'd stop writing for a week or two. And then Renee would eventually intervene and uh, kick me in the ass, and I'd start writing again. <laughs> Uh, but, it, you know, the per- perseverance is a big, big factor. We could tell stories all night about writers we know who um, collected rejection letters for a long time and, and hung with it and finally got published. Uh, mm-hmm. That's, that's going to happen to somebody this year and next year and next year. I'm not, I'm not overly optimistic when I tell people it can happen, but it happens every year. Yeah. Wow. I think that you and I both get uh, a lot of books that are sent to us from publishers but also manuscripts from writers or books that are published by s- small presses and uh, I always try to give them a look. Um, frankly a lot of times what I see is nothing that's right. worth going on with but still somebody helped me, somebody right. uh, took a look at, at me when I was struggling but also uh, we both had something to say and we both had an innate talent uh, I got some wonderful rejection letters in my time. Uh, I sent uh, uh, Bennett Cerf um, a book of mine called The Long Walk, <clears throat> which was eventually published under the Bachman name. And I got a rejection slip back saying, uh, uh, we're not interested in books that are this negative. So, you know, <laughs> his loss, what can I say? Did you keep them all? Uh, the rejection slips? Yeah. Yeah. I did for a long time, and then I thought to myself, maybe this is, uh, you know, a little bit, um, what do they call it, masochistic? Yeah. So yeah. I, st- I stopped. I, I, had a, I used to stick them on a nail and, on a wall, and finally the plaster gave away and the nail fell down. So. <laughs> uh, we're getting toward the end. I want to ask you, who's your favorite writer besides me? Steve, I love you and love your books, but no one can physically read all of your books, okay? It's just too many of them. And some of them are, you know, a thousand pages. They're doorstops. They're, they come in the mail like bricks, you know? And it's, oh boy, Steve had a good year last year. Here it is. It's 1,200 pages long. I can't do this. Um, and every page, solid gold. Yeah. About five years ago, I was doing Charlie Rose in New York, and, and Steve knows him well. I know him well. He's a great guy. And he, at the time, I'd written like you know 30 books, and I was doing two a year. And he says, "Why are you? Why, why do you work so? Why, why are you writing so many books?" And I said, "Well, Stephen King's written 52. I'm trying to catch him." And uh, that got back to Steve, by the way. So he kicked into high gear. And when Steve kicks into high gear, nobody's going to catch Steve. So. Um, well, we were, t- we were talking earlier. In the past month, uh, for some reason, I went back and started reading the Travis McGee novels, John D. McDonald. I read them when I was in law school uh, 30 years, 35 years ago. We were always passing around Travis McGee uh, paperback books. I had some buddies who loved to read. Um, what else am I reading? I read a lot of stuff that I don't finish. A lot of the galleys they send me like you. I mean, I'll, I'll give somebody 50 pages. Maybe a hundred yeah. pages. Yeah, fifty you know, pages. You know, if, if it's if it's a good publisher, maybe it's a, an editor, or a friend, somebody I know, <coughs> a friend of my agent, or somebody who you know needs a plug. I think we're always kind of looking to you know to to blurb something that's good. Maybe help somebody get started. I spend a lot of time doing that. It's usually not very productive. Mm-hmm. I'll show you how much clout I have in publishing. About five years ago, a young lawyer in Charlottesville. Um, I met him through a friend, and he was about to go off and research and write his first novel. And I thought, okay, yeah, I'll never see him again. And six months later, I got the email, his book was finished. I said, okay, now I guess i got to read the thing now. You know, yeah, pages. I know, that's the hard part. That's the hard part. So I read the book, thoroughly enjoyed it. The guy's a good writer, told a great story. And I've never done this in 25 years of publishing. I called my agent... Uh, who I've been with for 20 some odd years, very close friends, and I said, this guy can write, he can tell a story, you need to represent him, 
and sell this book. Okay? So David, I sent the book to David. Uh, he called back, and my agent, he called back and said, I don't get it. And I thought, well, screw you, okay? Yeah. <laughs> You're saying no to me? Okay. <laughs> So I called Steve Rubin, who is my longtime publisher at Doubleday, great friend of mine. He's now, he now runs Henry Holt. And I said, Steve, this guy can write. I love his story. Love the way he goes about it. You know, this guy's got a future. He can write. I said, plus, David, and we're all three good friends, David just said no, okay? So read this book, publishing, and we'll both screw David, okay? So I sent the book to Steve, he read the book, and he called back and said, nah, I don't get it. <laughs> so that's how much clout I have in publishing. It took the guy another year or two to find a publisher, a British publisher, who published the book, and he's, he's written two or three more now, but I mean, it's not, people think that you and I can pick up the phone and make the magic phone call, and it never works that way. No, I've had the same situation uh two or three times where I've read something that I thought was lightning, something that was just solid gold. And I've sent the manuscript on and I get that same reaction. Nah, it didn't really work for me. Well, why didn't it really work for you? Nah, it just didn't work for me, you know? It's kind of like uh, hitting on a brick wall. We're getting toward the end here, but I want to ask you one other question, serious. You wrote a book called The Innocent Man uh, a few years ago. We're in a death penalty state here. What's your opinion on that, the death penalty? Well, I'm very much opposed to it and have been for 20 years. When I was, uh, when I, was um, I told you how I grew up in this, you know, really uh, strict Southern Baptist culture, and, and most of my family is still that way, and they're wonderful people. We, just, we don't agree on a lot of things now. But I just didn't, um, I never thought about the death penalty. That's just the way, it, you know, we accepted uh, eye for an eye and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it was, I, I actually practiced law for 10 years and did a lot of criminal cases, never a capital murder case. I got lucky and never got appointed for a capital murder case, but, um, but I, I was a lawyer for 10 years. I had a lot of clients who went to prison. A lot of them went to prison. Most of them went to prison. Um, in spite of brilliant representation. <laughs> and, uh, but again, I, I, never, I never stopped to think about the death penalty, and, and, um, and it was a conversion experience. Uh, I, was in, uh, I was on death row in Mississippi in 1992 researching a book called The Chamber about a guy on death row in Mississippi who was about to be executed. The chamber is the gas chamber, right? Gas chamber, yeah. yeah. And uh, I'd, I'd been over there many times. I talked to the inmates. I talked to the executioner. I talked to the warden, the guards. You know, I, I knew the, I, I, I was doing my research and I was thoroughly fascinated with the research. And one of my last trips over there, uh, they have a little holding room that they bring the, the condemned man and he spends like the last two hours of his life and the room next door is the execution room. And uh, the little bunk and a table, whatever, and we were sitting there and it's really, uh, you know, it's dark and gloomy and you can only imagine how many men have gone through there and gone to, to death. And I was sitting there with a chaplain the chaplain was a retired Baptist preacher, and um, we were talking about some pretty heavy stuff, man. I mean, we were, we were talking about, you know, faith in God, and um, he said, uh, Mr. Christian, were you a Christian? And I said, yes, sir, I'm a Christian. He said, do you think Christ would condone what we do here? And I said, no. He said, I don't think so either. And that's, that was a conversion experience for me. Now, having researched it and read about it and, and written about it for the past uh, 20 years, even if you love the death penalty, you cannot support the current system. It's uh, so arbitrary and uh, unfairly um, used, and we have just, we've had 125 DNA exonerations through the Innocence Project in New York from death row. We have 400 total, coast to coast, all DNA, um, but 125 of those guys were on death row, including the one I read, I read about, I mean, I wrote about it. Ron Williamson in Oklahoma came within five days of being executed uh, for a murder he didn't commit uh, in about 1982. So mistakes have been made. We do not yet have 
uh, a clear DNA case that proves that we just killed the wrong guy. We got a couple of cases in Texas where the, the scientific proof uh, leans heavily in favor of killing the wrong guy, okay? But no DNA clincher. And I've often wondered what's gonna happen when we wake up one day and we have the clincher. We have the DNA clear proof that we just executed the wrong guy. And I don't know what's gonna happen as a society, a culture, a nation when, when that happens. So I don't know. It's, it's fascinating. I still, yeah. uh, I, I enjoy researching it now. Never, even in cases like Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy or, uh, never? Never. Okay. If it's wrong to kill, how can we kill in the name of the state? Yeah. And on that note, I think we'll thank you all very much. Thank you. My Ron. pleasure. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thank you. We can't let you all get away with giving you just a few small tokens to thank you so much for all of your help. You, we've raised over $200,000 because of you all. So, Mr. King, can you, I have to stand by the microphone. Can I ask you to step up? Who? Mr. King. Mr. King. Mr. Oh, King. So the first thing we have for you, we tried to decide what you give a man who probably has everything. And one of the things we know you like is... I don't have you, baby. <laughs> All right. Just ask. <laughs> we have a dinner for you, that'll a private dinner prepared by your favorite chef. Chef Ralph. And it'll be in your home whenever you'd like to schedule it. The other thing we have is more... More unusual, it's not a sleeping bag. <laughs> For those who don't know, Mr. King has a beloved Welsh Corgi dog named Molly. Molly is known as Molly, AKA the thing of evil. <laughs> so we have for Molly a personalized dog bed. Oh, this is so great. That says Molly, <laughs> AKA the thing of evil. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now that Molly is like a year, almost a year and a half old, it may actually last a while before turning into rags. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Grisham, um, we share at least one thing in common, sir. We're both legislators, as we talked earlier. I appreciate your time of service in Mississippi, and I'm sure your constituents and uh, fellow Mississippians did as well. On behalf of the Florida House of Representatives, we. Uh, gave one of these to Mr. King last year. We'd like to give you a tribute. Uh, My own resolution? Your own resolution, wow. sir, and thanking you for all your Beautiful. contributions to the literary world and every other cause that you've been involved in for good. So thank you so much. I don't have one of these from Mississippi. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you all very much. Thank you. John, we've got something for you from the Library Foundation as well. I mean, it's well, well known throughout the world that you're a great fan of the Cardinals. Yes, sir. And you started that, that love with the Cardinals when you were a young boy and yes, growing up in Mississippi. Yes, sir. The one question I have is, in 2013, when the Cardinals were in the World Series against the Red Sox, what kind of conversations did you guys have? Ugly, ugly. <laughs> well, he, we have... He did, ugly. <laughs> we we have, stopped talking. We have something special for you. We have a, a signed... Baseball from Stan Musial. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Authenticated. Oh, wow. Here's your authentication. And thank you so much for you your support of the me. Library Foundation. No, oh, it's. God, I'm... Thank you, Thanks, Thank you, John. Thank you. I'm getting choked up. Thank you. Wow. 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 Thank you. Um, I'm a bit starstruck. I'm Ava Eady, the library manager for the county, and I am um, amazed to have a room full of readers and huge supporters and off-the-charts authors, and so I am very grateful that I have a present here from RBI, which is the Reviving Baseball in Inner City. It's a major league baseball 
initiative working with the Pittsburgh Pirates. And so inside this bag for Mr. Grisham are a number of gifts, including t-shirts and baseball, and also a um, Pittsburgh Pirates t-shirt. Love so, the Pirates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.